right. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Heavy Galaxy Show at heavygalaxy.com. Matt and John with you for another great episode today. And we'd like to welcome as our guest today a gentleman that many of you will know from his time with 90s Brooklyn Doom Metal Heavyweights Typo Negative. And he's here today to talk about his new project, I Am. I'd like to welcome to the show Mr. Kenny Hickey. Kenny, what's up, man? Thanks for coming on. How are you, man? What's up, guys? Great to have you on, Kenny. Great to have you on, man. Well, let's get into it, dude. Uh, I am new brand, new project. Features several well-known names in the heavy rock and metal world, including your longtime bandmate with all your projects, uh, the great drummer Johnny Kelly. And, of course, also has Kirk Winstein and his former bandmate from Crowbar and Down and Todd Strange. I mean, you know, Kenny, anytime you got four guys from arguably the two biggest doom metal bands of the 90s together, man, it's going to pique a lot of interest from a lot of a lot of us older folks, especially here, man. But so I guess the first question, uh, how did the four of you guys come together? I mean, how did this all come to fruition? Whose idea was it? Just kind of fill us all in on that. Well, um, uh, it was actually uh, brought together by a friend of ours. Okay. Um, Andrew Spaulding, who was originally, um, he was a typos merch guy. That's how I met him. I met him actually on Danzig. I was playing with Johnny, uh, filling in. And uh, I did a Danzig tour back in like 2009. And that's how I met okay. Andrew. Uh, I first met Andrew sitting at the, uh, the La Park Hotel after rehearsal. He came to my room and we proceeded to drink a bottle of vodka together. Stood up to like five in the morning. That was it. We were inseparable <laughs> after that. So, you know, we were drinking buddies for many years. And then, you know, it so happens, you know, I know Kirk for years i mean I, I think i first met kurt probably in 95 you know the first time we ever played texas he came down to a typo show because he's always been a typo carnivore fan so i know him long 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 time and um andrew also lives in new orleans so he ended up i mean me and kirk have a lot in common he likes to drink i like to drink he would come from the same kind of background and uh, so Drew got along with him just as well as he got along with me. You know, they became great buddies. And it really it was just talking his imagination of, I love both of these guys. They're both my friends. Uh, they're both two of my favorite guitar players. What would happen if I got them and put them together in a room? So, you know, that's how it started. And um, Andrew started uh, his own little label on the side called Cor Corpse Paint Records. Mm -hmm. And he wanted his first thing, his first project to be to throw us in a room together. You know, me, Kurt. Todd, Johnny, see what happens. So he went and he 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 booked the whole thing. He financed it. You know, got everybody's schedule. We're like, oh, okay, all right, why not? Let's see what happens. You know, that's that's mm -hmm. how it started. So it was really just hope and prayer, <laughs> prayer, a, a plane ticket, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of riffs, and throw us in a room together. So nice, cool experiment. You know, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, that's the thing too. You know, <laughs> musically. I mean, the only I guess I guess the disappointing thing is you guys gave us a big whopping seven second sample so far. <laughs> you know, I'm like I, I was listening to it, like trying to figure out like what what's it going to sound like. You know, I mean, obviously I hear a little bit of like some silver tomb in there. You know, what I mean, it's it's a little uh, maybe I don't know. That's the thing; it's, it's hard to determine. We'll get seven seconds, so we're going to have to rely on you to now obviously tell us about which is probably better anyway than us doing it. But um, to just give us, I guess, what what does it sound like, man? I mean, what what did I mean, when you guys got together in a room, I mean, obviously you and Kirk got different, um, you know, obviously similar styles, but very different at the same time, different tones. Kirk's obviously got more of that, that sludge, you know, stuff, the Southern sludge metal. You got more of that Black Sabbath-y, I think, classic metal sort of stuff. I mean, describe the sound if the best you can, I guess, is what I'm Well, what's asking. the difference between Black Sabbath and Give us the goods. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> I mean, um, I think that... It came out like not as if anyone's going to be really expect. Everyone's going to expect these big black Sabbathian riffs and this mm -hmm. darkness, and it didn't come out that way. You know, it was. I had like a rock riff, and 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 uh, I sent it. I sent it to him over the phone, and then he wrote something off of that. So I had like a riff and a verse, and then he wrote a whole outro. With his mind off of that verse, you know, he wrote a couple of things. And then we brought it to a rehearsal studio and we just threw the ideas around. Johnny got in, picked up the tempo, you know, and we all pitched in on it. But we weren't sure what it was going to uh, sound like. And it ended up sounding more like a hard rock song than, than you know, like really dark metal, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's heavy right. in its own right, too. 
So um, I think sure. what happened is, I, I think what happened is we combined our styles, which is, they come from similar places. I mean, getting in a room together with these guys is like, you know, there was no, uh, there was no struggle to find a common language because, you know, we're all on the same age group, grew up listening to the same music, you know, we, we broke our musical minds, you know, in the seventies when we were growing up and then into the eighties. So we have a lot in common, you know, so it was easy to exchange ideas with each other. But I think what happened is because of the um, no time to lay a foundation or think about it, no time to preconceive it, just mm. throwing arts together, it become, sort of became what it wanted to become. You know, we, it was, I had to give up control of it. We all had to give up control of it to a large because we had three days to make this happen. Oh, okay. And I didn't want to let <laughs> Andrew down. We didn't want to let Andrew down. We don't want to look like assholes either. I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, it's scary. It's a risk. It's a risk. It could, you know, it could have came out, it could have hit the wall, come out like shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great. It came out great. You know what I mean? But it came out, I think, I mean, vocally, you haven't heard the other part of the song. It's classic, mm -hmm. my kind of vocal, you know, the way I sing. You know, okay. a lot of I did with typo. And then, but it's mixed in with Kirk's voice. So it changes it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's become a new thing, kind of like a new animal. It's got its own thing going on. You know, it's not like Crowbar. It's 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 not like Crowbar. It's not like Silver Tomb. It's not like typo. But it is kind of like all of those three things mixed. Okay. Awesome. Cool. And, and you're doing the majority of the vocals? Well, on, on this one, it ended up that way. I mean, I, I you know, I, I um, try to get Kirk to sing more. And then, you know, I mean, musicians by nature being lazy, he was like, oh, no, no, you sound great. You do it. You do it. I'm like, well, you know, I, so like I, I pulled him in on, on an answering and harmony. And then we did like a counterpoint answering thing on the end of the song. So there's a good portion of him singing. Yeah. Okay, cool. How many tracks? How many tracks all together? I don't know. That's nothing like crazy, you know. Uh, probably like uh, eight drum tracks, you know. Um, maybe three, um, six, four vocal tracks, bass track, double guitars, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Maybe like twenty-four, <laughs> you know, all together. You know, nothing crazy cool. like typo, you know, 48 tracks, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. we did add some overdubs, some leads, and some, um, you know, alternative guitar parts. But all in all, it's not that and, complicated. And, yeah, okay, cool. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, and you recorded it where, down south? Yes, yes. Um, we, we recorded it in uh, a studio in Florida. Oh, God, I forgot the name of the studio. Oh, <laughs> where about in Florida? Uh, in Tallahassee. Yeah. I, I oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's over by the Redneck Riviera. Yeah, the Redneck oh. Riviera. <laughs> Is Johnny still here? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Have drinks with a couple of those Southern boys and then a couple of you New Yorkers up there. Or well, New York you know, or New Jersey. I mean, you got, you got that accent. They're still there, just like Matt over here. <laughs> This is the thing, the thing about like Texas and New Orleans and Brooklyn. And I know because I've done a lot of touring with people from Texas and people from New Orleans. And for some reason, there's a kind of a bold, boisterous, loud nature to people from Brooklyn. And it's the same thing with people from New Orleans and the same thing with people from Texas. For some reason, we get along, you know, mm -hmm. naturally. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, That's no, I, I agree. Shit. Absolutely. No, I was going to ask, Kenny, you know, this, so the coming this uh, August, I know, is you got the 30th anniversary of uh, Bloody Kisses. Obviously, one of the biggest metal albums, you know, obviously in the 90s. Um, you got to remind me of these things 30 years ago. I know, it's a long time. I know, does, you don't want to think that number. I know, it's a long <laughs> number. But hey, it's, it's uh, you know, I mean, but yeah, I, I remember first, you know, obviously here in the Christian Woman, I think it was in. in in New York, WBAB, I think it was Fingers Metal Shop. I think it came on, um, and I remember it was such a unique style. And the thing was, obviously, at that time you had you know, grunge was huge, which had the '70s Sabbath inspired sound with Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. But of course, you guys were way, way different than any of that. Um, talking about New York, you know, one of the things about this picture behind me with Lamores is, you know, I always said that when Lamores closed in the early '90s there in Brooklyn, when it first closed. So did a lot of metal in general in New York. You know what I mean? Manhattan and Queens was mostly punk and hardcore. 
you know, um, most of the bands like you guys that were more metallic, you know, Life Agony and, and of course, Typo. I mean, it, it, I remember always the bands had to play really in the hardcore almost circles when you first kind of, you know, came out to even sort of break out because it wasn't really this like pure, like classic sort of metal scene in New York. It just didn't really exist, especially after the, you know, in that time. Um, you mean, you mean in the grunge era? Yes. Yeah. In the grunge era. Grunge laid you know. waste, all that stuff. You know. It did. I mean, you had, you did have some of the noise rock stuff, you know, those Juilliard bands, White Zombie, Helmet, Unsane, all those bands in the city. But yeah. so early, those early days, I mean, did you guys find it difficult really? I mean, I know obviously Pete already had his loyal following from Carnivore, uh, but especially on the slow, deep, and hard record, you know, before Buddy Kisses blew up. I mean, was well, that was, it yeah, that was 91, 89, 91. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was, it, it, right. Yeah, no, you're right. But in general, with those early 90s, yeah, okay, from 91, right before Buddy Kisses blew up, I mean, was it really tough for you guys to really find your place there at the time in New York because of just metal not being really embraced? It was really like a, you know, it was a, almost a taboo word for bands to be connected to at that point, from what I remember. Uh, it's kind of strange. We're a, weird, we're a weird band, you know? So we weren't really, I mean, still even hard. It's not a metal record. It's not a straight up sure. metal record. I mean, it's no, hardcore, it's noise, it's... Mm -hmm. It's all kinds of industrial, you know. Um, it was really like nothing was ever made before it. So mm -hmm. anywhere we played, people had question marks over the head. Like, what the hell are these guys doing? You know, I was like that on stage. Like, what the <laughs> fuck are we doing, man? You know, so we had, right from the start, we had like, it was it was hard for us to try to fit in anyway. I mean, our first tour for So Deep and Hard was Biohazard and the Exploited. Oh, wow. Okay. It was the first tour, and that was North America in 91. And just think of a bunch of punk rock and hardcore kids in the audience listening to us playing one beat per minute, you know? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the fuck? We're killing each other. Stop. You know, or they'd still be fucking mocking and killing each other, and we'd be playing slow as shit, you know? <laughs> they didn't get it. Nobody got it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, really hard for us to fit in right from the get go. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we, but we did kind of cause we were so eccentric and weird. We um, sort of like rapidly got this, you know, cult following started mm -hmm. up from more mm -hmm. on in Brooklyn. And we would play stuff like zone decay in Manhattan and other clubs. And slowly every club we played more and more people came. So we mm -hmm. built up a cult following within two years of releasing so deep and hard, you know, a year and a half, maybe. Mm. So a pretty good one, a pretty decent one. It sold like 40,000 records back then. It was a lot for Oh, wow, that's a lot, yeah. Indie yeah. label, you know, it was a big deal, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, and then, you know, I, I think because we're a weird band, it's another thing that saved us when grunge came, when the acts of grunge came, you know? Mm -hmm. All the hair bands and all the other shit. Well, we weren't really quite like any of them either. You True. Know? Mm -hmm. I'd like this kind of like pseudo goth thing going on and this like comedic Devo thing mixed in with it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, so it was a kind of a weird band then. So we kind of didn't slip between the cracks. We kind of seeped yeah. through all the cracks. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Good point. We were still weird yeah, enough, you... but we were, we were still cool enough. I mean, none of snails. Trent Probably. asked us to open up for him. I remember that, yeah. Four. I mean, you know, he wasn't asking any metal bands to open up for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So we had yeah, kind of like a weird, eclectic thing about us. But we had so much shit going on and eccentric stuff that we kind of fit in almost everywhere. And that's why I, we kind of like the perfect opening band. We could like put a song on for any genre we were opening up for. You know, we had hardcore songs. We had metal songs. We had mm -hmm. gothic songs. We had love you guys, rock and roll. You guys opened for Molly, Molly Crew too, I believe, correct? I, and another example. We were yeah. like, Molly <laughs> Crew, you crazy? We can't open up for Molly <laughs> Crew. That's nuts. They're a hair band. They're going to kill us, you know, to throw shit at us. Man, were we wrong, man. They loved us. <laughs> Their audience loved us. You know, that was the Karabi. When tour. was that? That was 1994, I believe, or 95. When, you know, or in a cusp. And, um, right. 1994. And it was all sheds all summer long, all over the States, all outdoor sheds. It was a rock and roll, you know, camp, summer <laughs> camp. It was like, it was the most awesome experience ever. We just came from like, we had a shitty bus. And I think a trailer, and we were playing crap holes across the country, you know, for like 50 people in it. Mm, okay. Trying to break bloody kisses, you know. And uh, I guess those guys were listening to our record while they were recording their record, and they liked the band. So they just, on a whim, said, I want to take these guys out. 
Wow. You know, and I, That's you know, funny. my manager was like, you got to take this tour. We were like, no fucking way. We'll never fit in with that. They're going to kill us. He was like, believe me, take this fucking tour. You're going to be playing in front of people. You'd never be, a, be playing from. Otherwise, they would never heard of you. Man, was he right. Because Motley Crue broke this band. Yeah. Broke. Oh, really? They did, huh? Okay, interesting. Yeah, it started the you whole You guys ended up... Interesting. You guys ended up on Headbangers Ball at some point, didn't you? That summer, yeah. Yeah, they picked it yeah. up. Yeah, recently... Oh, God, what's this? You know, recently, I thought about Motley Crue and you guys. I think I'd read that, and I thought, that's that's some crazy shit right there. It's just, it's just crazy. Now, what would you say would be the weirdest matchup you ever had on a tour, meaning with another band besides Motley Crue? Um, in excess. <laughs> in Europe? Wow. That's a festival thing. You know, they mix up okay. a lot. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But the hardest band but for, for us ever. The hardest band for us ever to open up for was definitely Nine Inch Nails because at the time, mm. you know, I know that Trent liked the band and considered the band like an influence. And that's why he had us and I'm really, really grateful to this day for him for having us. It didn't do much for us because at the time he was playing theaters two nights a week on the west coast coming down the west coast and at the time nine inch nails was so hot that their audience had just nine inch nails you know blinders on sure. they didn't want to see anyone man they literally mm. threw shit out of us every night there were these fucking guys oh. nine inch nails fuck you and that was the only time that ever happened to us really you know but you know it was still a great thing to yeah, do, i, I could I mean, you probably played in front of a good chunk of people at that point in time. Now, recently, Jerry Springer died. And oh, really? I you know bring that, that up. Yeah. Ooh. And so I bring that up because Peter was on that show once. Ooh, <laughs> Do you yeah, remember? What's that? Rock stars and their groupies. That was the name of the yeah. episode. Mm -hmm. How did that do with the band? How did it what? Like, how did that end up affecting the band, if at all? Oh, it definitely affected the band. You know, it's, it's good press. You know, mm -hmm. you know, on national television, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how much does it really affect because when you think about it to her audience were or his audience were the parents that, that were there to hate us right were there to hate you like, <laughs> yeah. all that shit yeah. and, and yeah. the only people that were watching it were fans were probably already fans <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah you know hey, hey, it, yeah no press, no press is bad press that's true yeah that's very yeah. true yeah hell he yeah. was in playgirl too <laughs> that was a weird thing you know I don't know how Positively, that affected the panel negatively. <laughs> it's still out there. It's still being. Well, I, 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 someone told him eventually that there were more men subscribers than women, and he was like, "Oh shit, I heard." <laughs> there is. There's more men subscribers to that. There were more men subscribers to that magazine. <laughs> well, I mean, it's good, it's good. Again, again, did it do? Did it do what we set out to do? <laughs> I don't think so. It did something, but you know, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. You know, when I think of uh, you know Peter, obviously with his lyrics and humor. You know, speaking just of Peter and, and today, I mean, I would have to think. I mean, people were obviously after him from some shit back in the day too, accusing him of you know, even with the carnivore stuff. Or, you know, I'm just you know, in terms of like what we see today with all this cancel culture. I mean, he, he if he came, it was still right in the way he did today. I don't know if he would. If he'd be allowed to, I don't know if the record labels would put out his music, you know, because basically, you know, it's just his humor. You know, I mean, no one could take that kind of humor anymore these days. Everyone's so sensitive and shit. I mean, well, well Peter, you know, if he shut his mouth, they put his music out. <laughs> 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 would never shut his mouth. He loved, he loved to push buttons, you know, he loved mm -hmm. to make, you know, uh, like a combination of communist and fascist symbols and put them mm. on his hat and his shirt, mm. you know, make up all this crazy shit to like, you know, to, to provoke people because sure. that's what he loved to do, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. you know, I mean, one of his favorite bands in the world I mean, it was Leibach. You know, if you know who Leibach is, they are, they are a, a band in Europe that does exactly that. Mm-hmm. You know, they they, uh, huh. they, they dress in not, Nazi, they used to dress in like Nazi outfits and perfect how they're not fascists. And Peter loved to do stuff like that, you know. So he would have definitely put his foot in his mouth. He would definitely put a monkey wrench in it. We would have had problems. There's no doubt about it. And he probably could not have stopped himself. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah. Fuck with people, you know. You know, I mean, yeah. that's what he did. Yeah. Well, I know. And this year, this obviously is past April. It's been 13 years now. Obviously, since he's, you know, he's he's passed. Just like you said, I mean, just uh, there's gonna be uh, no one ever like there's, there's never gonna be someone like him again. I mean, just musically, personally, everything. And I know you probably get this question a lot, um, but obviously we're we're currently now these days. You know, there's all this '90s nostalgia now, right? '80s is out, '90s is back. Um, I know there's been all a lot of hypothetical talk about you know possibly you know doing a show i mean no no that there's ever been anything you know i mean i know johnny said a thing or two about if you guys ever did you'd probably have all guest vocalists or have a female vocalist whatever it may be um i know josh do someone i know i know josh is completely done with music you know yeah, he, um, will, he will he will not do it and I, you know, it, huh? truth, I can't see doing it without him so yeah okay yeah even as a celebratory thing it's just not even worth it huh I, you know yeah. uh, I don't see it as being worth it. None of Josh doesn't do it. And like, True. like I guess Johnny was saying, I wouldn't like start a typo counterfeit band and run around the world trying to make money off of it. You know? It's oh no. Like yeah. Maybe, maybe a tribute show. Yeah. Like one show. Yeah, exactly. The most. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's possible. That's it. Mm-hmm. Now, but then I, mean, what do you, I mean, I think people would love it, but that's, that's something that a band has to do with their own. At their Absolutely. own speed, you know, if they want to ever do it. Now, you about nowadays, Kenny. I mean, what bands or music are you listening to nowadays? Oh, uh, you know, I listen, I listen to a lot of classic stuff. You know, um, that's basically what we're I mean. Nothing new. I'm a big I'm a big Tool fan. You know, okay. But yeah, you know, whatever's dark and heavy out there. You know, so you know, nothing but, really but, new but, is is. No, uh, not that much. Not that much. No. Yeah. Did you play? Did, did you guys play? Did Silver Tune play at Psycho Vegas a couple of years ago? Yeah, we did. We did. It was great, too, man. It went awesome. Yeah, I do remember that. All right. Well, you did. Yeah, that was fun, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. We played, uh, yeah. there's there's a casino bar or whatever inside, and it was packed. Man. Yeah. Was yeah, yeah. Great. That's. We had a great time, and then you know everybody hung out at the bar afterwards, and we you know we raged to like three in the morning, and then I came home with COVID. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> so many people. Yeah, that's the same thing. weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a little crazy, risky back then. Uh, that psycho did that. I'd already had COVID, so I walked in there like I had iron, like armor on. And I even had someone crash at my place right after Psycho that needed a place. And she had COVID. (laughs) And I didn't get any of it. (laughs) No vaccines. We're at this bar. We're at the bar and everybody's drunk. I wasn't drunk because I quit drinking. But everybody's drunk. And they're just like spitting. Ah, Yeah, Paul! (laughs) It's landing in your mouth. There's no way you can leave without getting COVID. Yeah. I mean, I remember looking over and like pep. Pepper was over there partying one minute. Brent Bjork from Caius the next. I mean, yeah, that was a great uh, little area to all hang out at. Um, and I remember great. you guys, yeah, real good crowd. That's where I hung out the majority of time. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I went out for some of the bigger shows in the one main arena. Uh, you yeah, sure did I. I mean, <laughs> Danzig. <laughs> I think it was that year or something. So yeah, they were great. Dancing was great that night, and then um, oh, uh, down was great. Like, just... So good. That's right. Johnny had a, what do you had double double duty that trip? <laughs> yeah, yeah, double duty. And Johnny I got to take, you know, yeah, I got to take my youngest daughter Aaliyah up to meet Glenn. That was cool. Oh, he's cool. A, he's a fan and stuff. So it was a fun weekend. Yeah, how long have you known? How long have you known Glenn? Well, the first time we opened up for Danzig was that fall September after Motley Crue. So oh, like wow. 90, since 94. So the John Christ days, you know? Yeah. 
Magnet is from up in that neck of the woods as well, right? Monster yeah, Magnet? Jersey guys. Jersey. The jersey. Yeah, the jersey. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, we you talked were supposed to do a tour. Yeah, you were supposed to do a tour a couple years ago, COVID era, with Nebula and Monster Magnet. What a matchup yeah. that would have been. Oh, my yeah. God. Back in the day, um, with Seven Floyd, we toured with Monster Magnet in Europe and had a great time. And then they were going to have us out with Silver Tomb. And uh, at the time, I was in rehab. And then I just got out of rehab. It was like January 20th of that, of 2020, I think. When did COVID start? 19? 2020. 2020. Yeah. And we had this okay. big tour planned. And um, COVID hit. Everything started shutting down. The lights started shutting yeah. down all over the one by one by one. And we all got crushed. So. Yeah, yeah, that was that was. I was ready for that. That was like, we had that show coming up in Vegas, and we had Uncle Acid, which is from England, coming over, and that was a big thing, and ah, got mm -hmm. all taken away for a while. So, that's yeah. that's some wild shit. <laughs> I yeah, love like just a few years ago. What's that? I'd love to tour with them again. I'd love to tour with them again. Yeah. Did oh, how yeah. how much did COVID? You know, because I know with Silver Chew, I mean, you guys kind of really built that up and right when that album came out i mean it wasn't out you know that long before covid that really derailed a lot of the momentum that you guys were it sure derailed it up, right the whole thing it yeah threw it off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we really got derailed really bad by it but you know what are you yeah. going to do circumstances and circumstances i mean in in uh, on the up swing to it i got sober mm -hmm. i built a studio in my house wrote another whole record you know so mm -hmm. I'm so what were you now on, on the other hand, a lot, of my friends, now. You know, a lot of my friends that were drinkers, COVID either killed them or nearly killed them because, mm -hmm. you know, they were on, yeah. you know, government assistance yeah. like everybody was getting money and no yeah. job. So they just drank themselves to death, you know, and I would have been one of those uh, people. But I, 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 as usual, I have this dumb luck. Like I got the worst luck and the best luck. I got terrible luck and then something good luck happens and saves my ass, you know. <laughs> So COVID was good for me. You know, I, I had no stress. I got to stay home. I had to work on my recovery and uh, it positive results. I'm still here today, three, over three years, three and a half years later. So. Oh, nice. Congrats, man. So you, Congratulations. So, so, yeah. Nice. So Silver Tube, you said you got a whole nother record uh, in, the, in the bank? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Incident Bank, I'm, I just, um, I just mixed half of it and uh, we're looking to release it ASAP, you know. Oh, Okay. Very nice. Uh, yeah. How, uh, so now with I am, I mean, are you I, obviously you know Kurt's got all his commitments and everybody does. Johnny obviously is in a gazillion things. Um, what What's going to happen with that? You guys, it's just, it's just a project. You got to put a record, maybe maybe play a few shows or or is is, is Silver Tube still your main? Is that still your baby? That's still your, your main. Oh, baby? that's always going to be my okay. baby. This is my okay. baby. But sure. Uh, Kirk just called me this morning. I mean, it was six o'clock in the morning. You know, I, I couldn't go back to sleep. You know, I wake up like five in the morning. I can't go back to sleep. And he was like, hey, Rockstar, call me when you're drinking enough coffee, right? So I called him this morning, and he was like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to be hungry. He's got a crazy schedule. Like, he's going to England, I think, tomorrow. You know, then he comes back. He plays um, Milwaukee Metal Fest. Then he goes back again. Then he comes back again. So he's got a window of time coming, like, June 23rd all the way to, like, May uh, to July 3rd, where we're going to get together. I'm going to fly to New Orleans and get me a hotel. I mean, I'm going to just sit in a room, wait for the guys to come. They're going to come somewhere around the 25th. We'll work on some stuff. And we're just going to go into the studio and dive in again, just like we did with this last song. We'll see right. what comes out of it. So we're all very excited about the way the last song came out. We had such a great experience together. So, you know, we want to do it more. Very cool. and, you know, it, so we'll get a good, you know, a little body of music out there. Whether it's an EP or an LP, depends how much comes out of us, I guess. Mm-hmm. Right. And we'll go from there, you know. Uh, I mean, how exciting it is, how well the reaction is. And, and yeah, we want to play some shows. Yes. I know everybody is in a lot of stuff. They got a lot on their plate. Sure. You know, I mean, that's how you got to be. You have to these days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you have to, yeah. anyhow, these days. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, totally understandable. I'm now psyched. We... To... Yeah. No, yeah. We're psyched to hear it, man. I mean, what now with anything type, I know you guys re released Dead Again last year. Any, any talks about. Any other re-releases with Typo, or, or is it, are you just kind of putting that to bed for now? And 
focusing on what you guys got going on currently? Uh, I'm pretty sure we got some releases coming up. I'm not, I'm not sure which one he's going to do next, but my, my manager. But we are putting out a coffee. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That'd be nice. So, you okay. know, I just, I just signed a bunch of things for that. <laughs> so look out for a typo negative coffee you're coming out. Typo negative coffee. Very cool. What, 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 kind, <laughs> of blend, what kind of blend coffee? We, is it Ara Ara Arabic, Colombian, or any, anything particular? I'm not sure. I didn't get to try this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was one before that that I really liked, but now apparently we went to another company. I didn't get a sample yet. When okay. I get a sample, you know, I'll let you know. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely, man. Hey, hey, well, Kenny, I mean, when, so, Kenny, when you look back your senior year of high school, what was some of the, your favorite bands, if you remember? Uh, I was a huge Judas Priest fan. Senior year yeah. of high school. I think Defenders of the Faith came out. I remember oh. I was huge. I was a huge Judas Priest fan. Like that's where I, I come from like what Sabbath. Else? Zeppelin, Sabbath, um, Pink Floyd, and you know, Judas Priest was my choice of metal, not Iron Maiden. And uh, I remember you know, back then you went to Zigzag Records, right, to get a record because <clears throat> you bought records then and you didn't even know like I didn't it wasn't like not a lot of kids bought magazines to figure out what's going on. You know, I didn't. I wasn't a magazine buff, so I'd go to the record store, and that's how you would discover records. Out, I remember seeing the, the Defenders of the Faith cover. It's like Judas Priest came out with an album with that, and I listened. I loved it. I used to have this um, I had a Fisher stereo system. It was when oh, you yeah. had great stereo systems in your mm -hmm. living room with huge, like three foot high speakers. Yep, and a great power amp. And I used to lay on the floor. And lay the spirit speakers like a pyramid over my head, you know, and blast the thing on eight. <laughs> Blow my face off, you know. I loved and it was like going to the concert, you know. And uh that was the first like concert I saw at the Meadowlands Arena it was Defenders of the Faith, 1984. Who opened up? Yeah, oh, it was amazing. You know, it's kind of experiences you never forget, right? Do you remember what band opened there? up? No. Yeah, I don't man. do not remember what band. I don't even know it, if I showed. I, we got there in time, <laughs> big man. But when concerts are different. They play, you, pay, you, you pay yeah. twenty dollars for a ticket, you know, and then you went, you got wasted in, in the parking lot. You know, you're gonna go to the open band, and then <laughs> that's how it was, you know. And the shows, oh my god, they had that big, huge stage set up with that creature with the arm that came down and the fire. And it was, Amazing, you know, and of course, as usual with Judas Priest, they sounded absolutely perfect, like the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's phenomenal. Amazing. Life. Yeah, when, phenomenal they, life, when they played in DC for that tour, they toured with Great White. When Great White just had their, they they weren't even popular yet. They had so it must have been Great album. White. I, it might have been because that yes, would probably yes. be the same I remember. Tour area because I'm from DC. I'm from the DC area originally. Uh right. so yeah that's it, it Judas Priest that so you're probably just a few years older just a few years older than me. Uh mm -hmm. Judas Priest I got into them through Defenders and then right. someone's like if you like Defenders you're gonna like this because they recorded it at like the same time practically and Scream for Vengeance was like holy shit I got top of the price got a phenomenal life. Seminal re metal record of eighties of the eighties of all time. You know, Scream for Vengeance. Favorite song by Judas Priest. What's your favorite? Uh, I'm doing an interview. Uh, probably <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of a song by uh, Electric Guy, maybe. You know. Mm. Nice. Not Love Bites, huh? I love Love Bites. You know, I love Love Bites. I love the Sentinel. I love all that stuff. Now, now, you know, I could yeah. still like, you know, like a lot of times some of the stupid metal you listen to in the 80s, you just can't go back and listen to. It's like, retarded. yeah, the yeah. Lyrics are retarded. Everything's retarded. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. How do they listen to it? You know? mm -hmm. At Judas Priest, I could still return I, to, you know, it's, they're fucking great. I <laughs> am returning to Turbo. I was just going to ask about Turbo. They were always doing something inhumanly possible. On their records and live, like the way he sung, who could do that? Nobody, you know. And the guitar playing was just out of this world, you know. It's like otherworldly. You can't touch it, you know. It's just still great. Albums sound great too. Yeah. Turbo. 
That's where I left. For sure. Got a little too, you know, ain't a lover stuff. You know. Mm. <laughs> it was funny because we all knew. We all knew yeah, he was gay back knew. then. Everyone knew. Yeah. I don't, care about, that. I don't yeah. care about that because my the first rock yeah. star I ever worshipped was Elton John. And I was probably like six years old, five years old, you know, mm. Uh, uh, Yellow Brick Road mm-hmm. is my favorite record in the world. Because you get the iron on t shirts yeah, and, nice. and put, put the uh, Ellen John iron ons on my shirts and stuff. And then, you know, we all found out he was gay in the 70s. And, you know, and I was young yeah. male in the 70s. So I was kind of like upset for a little bit, but then I didn't care. You know, so wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ellen John was so yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, who cared? You know, it, exactly. and um, it was just so by the time, you know, it, it came time for priests, you know, that was nothing. I didn't. What's the big yeah, deal? It really was why, why Rob had to hide it for all those years. I mean, he wasn't really hiding it when you think about it. You know? mm, as in your face. Who cares? Who gives yeah. a damn? You know? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The it's, first time I ever met Rob Halford was, we had, this was probably 93, and this is probably be, right before the Motley Crue tour. We played of uh, this dive bar called the Mason Jar in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and he was living in. Or Rob Halford was living in Arizona at the time. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. And we're on stage in this little shitty club, right? Can barely fit on the stage. Josh's keyboard rig is like to my right as usual, and you know, I'm drinking and playing. And I, I look to my right, <laughs> and I see this bald guy peek out from behind Josh's rig and look at me, and I went. Gee, that guy looked like Bob Halford, and he did it again. <laughs> he came down his head with his shitty club. He liked the band, and we ended up meeting him in the parking lot. We were in the parking lot. We went out to the parking lot at the end of the show, and he was hanging. He hung out with us in the parking lot, talked with us, and bullshitted That's with awesome. us for like an hour. What a great guy! Yeah, that had to been amazing for you. It was. It was amazing. It was just one of the many amazing moments you know i would go on to meet tony iomi and laugh and hang out with him and and ozzy osbourne and every all the all, all the heroes that, that i grew up with nice yeah yeah he's always been good about like you know embracing all the new sh- you know shit rob you know he wasn't an old head it was like yeah it's not my my you know it's not from my era so i'm not going to get into it. he's always embraced new things and been very supportive of but even to today even though there's a lot of new bands to today he's always been like such a great ambassador for metal He's you the know. ambassador of metal. That's exactly yeah. right. If it's metal, he's yeah, going to be yeah, knowing them, what it is, who's doing it, you know, and he's, he's going to be in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, if you think about, like, after Turbo, they got super heavy again. They were even borderline thrash on some songs. <laughs> it was a fascinating time, you know? Yeah. You know, even with Turbo, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad record. I, mean, I just, I kind of like, I went this way. You know, yeah. after Defenders, you know, like other mm-hmm. things happen. You know, Metallica's happened, Slayer happened. You know, that was the next evolution of of Judas Priest was Slayer, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I look at it this way: Slayer was an evolution from Judas Priest, and Metallica was an evolution from Iron Maiden. And that's how I always looked at it. Because they were more <laughs> Iron Maiden, you know. But in, they just took it to an extreme. You know what I mean? Sped it up. They they mixed it with thrash. They mixed. I mean, they mixed it with you know hardcore and with with punk. So I always kind of looked yeah. at Slayer, like, you know, uh, Glenn Tipton and KK Downey was, you know, was was Kerry King and Hammond, you know. So I got That's heavily into Slayer at that point. That's another band I can still go back and listen to with Slayer. Love Slayer. Mm-hmm. Who's the that? most underrated? Who's the most underrated guitarist, in your opinion? Well, I don't know. You know. Um, I like. I tend to like guitar players that are not like. I I would say Glenn, Glenn Tipton. I I'd have to say Glenn Tipton from Judas Priest. I know he's respected as a fantastic legato, amazing guitar player, but not enough, in my opinion. I think he's yeah. one of the most amazing guys, amazing players to ever pick up the instrument. Now, uh, Kenny, do you still? Because you know Brooklyn right now, you know, has got like such a really good. It's it's more of like a heavy rock, you know, scene going on right now. There's a lot of like, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's like bands like this band Towers out of Brooklyn. There's a bunch of really good, like sort of, you know, old school classic metal slash maybe stone or heavy rock bands. It's got a good scene. Band Sedhedron, who I think they got signed by Metal Blade. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been touring with some bands. I know you, you're probably not really going to a lot of these shows, but have you have you checked out anything? You know, 
have you seen anything recently with, with, with you know the scene in Brooklyn and and does it compare to anything you know that you could tell from when you were coming up with typo negative there at Lemoore's back in the early 90s it's got a similar vibe you know what I mean I mean yeah. I, I, a lot of guys they try to complain about whatever how Williamsburg and Brooklyn has changed and it's this hipsters and stuff and I kind of think I kind of really like what they did with the neighborhood yeah. there. cool bars is you know young people mm -hmm. hanging out there's Everybody's having a good time, and there is. There's a rock scene and a metal scene. Oh, yeah. There hasn't been that in Brooklyn. Long time. Since 93, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's been mm -hmm. gone, and it's come back. And we've played, you know, Silverton played St. Vitus, not recently, but about, you know, yeah. just before Christmas last year. And it was mm -hmm. great, man. You know, we had a great show. People showed up, and, you know, um, you could still go and see cool, heavy bands there up close, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. So St. Vitus is... Legendary in the scene right now. Yeah, like yeah. St. Vitus is known for throughout the country is like that's a that's a it's spot like I gotta hit at some point in time. It's like the CBGBs of metal, you know, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There you go. Well it's it's amazing yeah. what's I, happening I, in Brooklyn. I, I, think, I think they pay their rent. <laughs> yeah, right. True. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, just general Brooklyn. So, you know, it's just so different. Obviously, you said Williamsburg, but I I lived in Greenpoint for a little you know a while there and it you know, Williamsburg, you didn't really, you never went there. It was kind of a bit of a shithole, and a lot of those places were shitholes. You know what I mean? So oh, yeah, I mean, Bed what was that? I mean, you know, Bed Stuy is yeah. insane. That's insane. What's happening in that place? But Bed Stuy was yeah, yeah bullets and and stabbing. Oh, yeah. Every day. Oh, yeah. But Williamsburg was kind of industrial, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, had some had some projects and stuff, but run down industrial. You know, mm -hmm. nobody hung out there. No, no, not even close. Cool. Well, hey, Kenny, man, uh, you got anything else, John, for for Kenny before we wrap this up? No, th thanks for uh, putting up with me, Kenny. Oh, thank you, man. You guys <laughs> been great. Yeah. So, just quick, "Dreams Always Die with the Sun" that is the single. It comes out June second on Corpse Paint Records. Uh, where, Kenny, should we send you know uh, listeners, viewers, just to keep up with what's going on uh, with everything I am and, uh, you know, just keep up with you guys and, you know, whatever's future happenings and so forth. If you guys are playing shows and all that good stuff. Yeah. You know, always go to the, uh, I am Instagram, right. Okay. Just sign into that. Or you can, you can come to my, um, Facebook RSK page, Kenny Hickey on Facebook and, you know, get all the info you need and it, it'll be up in, in local stores or you can get the CD from local stores if they order it for you or, and you can always stream it on Spotify. And Apple Music, yeah, fantastic. So June second, everybody, check it out. Dreams always die with the sun. Mister Kenny Hickey, man, appreciate it. take your time, talk to us, man, and yeah, good luck. Hopefully, uh, we'll see you on the road soon, whether it's with Silver Tomb or I am or whatever you got going on, man. You will. Oh, Thanks, yeah. guys. Awesome.